Uh, one of the things that people always asked me about my campaign was, what's it really like out there when you're out there going around and meeting all these people and they're taking you home for dinner and doing all these various things? You know, we see, we know what we hear in the newspapers and that kind of thing, but what's it really like? So Ron is here to tell you what it was really like. He's going to talk to us on how I spent my summer vacation and the rest of 1988. Dr. Ron Paul. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. I'll have to think up something nasty to say about David talking about fetuses in medical school. I got, you know, one thing I know is there's, you know, too many people in government, but don't you think there are too many attorneys in government too? <laughs> Ed, sit down back there. We weren't referring to you. I mean, there are a few good attorneys, but not too many. <laughs> But it is a, a real delight to be here with you today and uh, share with you some of the adventure of, actually it was a, more than a year, it turned out to be about 18 months. Uh, there was a fair amount of traveling involved, uh, something like 700,000 miles. I was glad to get home, to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, somebody asked me one time, how many days out of the week did I campaign? And I very frankly told them the truth, eight days out of the week I was campaigning. <laughs> But uh, it was a definitely a worthwhile experience and uh, something that I would never do again. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it, it was uh, something that I think that I felt good about. I think a lot of good will come from the campaign and I feel good about uh, what's been happening. And there have been a few individuals who did some special things in the campaign that was uh, uh, helpful, uh, very helpful and generous. Of course, uh, my wife, uh, who kept my family together during that time, was very helpful, and she's sitting in the back. My wife, Carol, is with me today. <laughs> also, one of the, probably the most disappointing things of the campaign was that uh, we didn't have about five or 10 or 15 or $20 million for television advertising. And we did put one television ad together and it got on a few areas of the country, but the major ad that many of you saw you know, at the National Convention was really the handiwork of uh, Lou Rockwell. And it's just too bad that we weren't able to use more of his talents uh, in television and some other things, which could have been done with money. But Lou certainly deserves a round of applause and some credit for doing some real creative work on that television ad. <laughs> Now, there was a campaign chairman around. His name used to be Bert Blummert, uh, but I'm not sure where he is now. Is Bert here today? See, no, he said he had heard enough from me over the past year. He came to a lot of the meetings, but I think he is uh, around and will be around. But Bert really did a grand job as being the campaign chairman as well as the chairman of Ballot Access Committee. And uh, Bert, uh, certainly to me, is somebody who is a, a real bulwark of the party and was real supportive and, and probably was an individual that was key in uh, uh, influencing me in the direction that I've gone, and that is by rejecting uh, one of those older parties and joining the new in the party of the future. You know, as the campaign went on, uh, there was certainly a lot more enthusiasm. The crowds were bigger, and uh, where we go into one state in the early part of the year, there might be 10 or 15 people in a small state party, and then we would go back toward the end or near the uh, uh, time of the election and maybe have 150 or 180, and the parties generally were very excited about what was, uh, what was happening. At the end of the campaign, near the end, uh, one of the best pieces of coverage that we had occurred, I believe, with the McNeil uh, Lair report. They uh, had some coverage on the convention and the, some background and, and then some interviews, and we had a lot of favorable calls uh, from that uh, interview. And I was just thinking, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you could combine that with the evening news plus paid television? I think we could certainly have influenced a lot more people uh, over that year. But after that show was on, I know I had a trip in the next day into um, uh, 
Detroit, Michigan, and I was met by a key supporter and a good friend of the Libertarian Party, uh, Jim Rodney, and he met me there, and he was so excited about it all, and he was so pleased, and, and uh, he, he, was, he had just seen the program, and he says, you know, Ron, he says, all we need if we just had six more months. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we need a little more than six more months, but, <laughs> but he was feeling good about it, and I think there's reason to feel good about it, and uh, as time goes on, we'll get more and more uh, of those type of programs over the years. Now, I did another survey just recently since I've been here, and I am really seriously thinking about asking for a recount, because just recently, I went out in the local parking lot here, walked around, saw more Ron Paul bumper stickers. I didn't see any Bush or Dukaga stickers. <laughs> and I just know there must have been a miscount someplace along the way. <laughs> You know, coming back to uh, Las Vegas is interesting, too, because we had uh, several campaign stops here and generally had some favorable coverage. We uh, had uh, the media would come out and the newspapers would come out, and uh, we got the coverage we needed uh, and what we expected. But I found it very interesting. Uh, one morning I got the paper as we were leaving town, and the article uh, was very blunt. They said, you know, we really like those libertarians. We really like Ron Paul and that tax issue because that ta income tax is really has to go. But this position on gambling, we just can't understand it and we can't support it. He wants to legalize gambling in all the states. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody has their own ax to grind. Uh, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, we had a, a nice reception there with, on the, on the, with the students. And one of the average or the usual question that comes up uh, very frequently with uh, students has to do with uh, uh, the antitrust laws and monopolies. Because students are just finishing their economics course and they're told, watch out. You can never have laissez-faire capitalism because the monopolies will eat us up. And uh, just think of the horrors of the 19th uh, century. So the student asked this, and I explained uh, in my best manner to tell him that even the antitrust laws are not uh, interpretable. That, uh, you know, if you have uh, everybody, uh, if somebody charges too much, that means they have too much of the market and they're gouging everybody. If they're charging too little, that means you still are too strong and you're cheating and running out the competition. And if you all charge the same thing, that means you've worked in collusion. And uh, afterwards, uh, there was a student came up to me, <clears throat> and uh, he, uh, he introduced himself as being a, uh, a student, uh, an individual who had migrated, uh, immigrated from the Soviet Union. And um, he, he said that uh, that reminded him of a joke when he was in the Soviet Union. He'd come here in the, the mid-70s. And uh, he said that, the joke was there were three people and three Russian prisoners, and the one prisoner, and they got to talking, and the one prisoner says uh, they want to know why each other was in the prison. And one prisoner said, well, you know, I kept getting to uh, work uh, too early, and they accused me of uh, um, buddying up to the, uh, to the officials. And the other fellow said, well, I kept getting there too late and I was cheating the state, so they put me in prison. The other person said, well, I kept getting to uh, work on time, and they accused me of owning a Western watch. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, uh, I've, I've received a lot of uh, credit during the, uh, during the year and a lot of compliments and people are very appreciative in the party and I appreciate, excuse me, I appreciate that very much. Uh, the one thing though that uh, uh, somebody said, well someday they're going to uh, give me a medal, you know, for going out and doing this campaigning. And I said, well, it really, not the campaigning and not for the positions I take and what we've accomplished because that's to be expected, but there is, if you ever wanted to give me an award, it has to be for doing something way above and beyond the call of duty, and that was to appear on the Mort Downey show. <laughs> that was risky business, and uh, the name recognition went up, and uh, it helped a few other things, but uh, the next go around, since I've left, uh, since I've left the campaigning, uh, the Mort Downey show called me once again, but I was a little more cautious about uh, how anxious I needed more name recognition. So, uh, 
I uh, didn't, didn't get on that show, but they had a very special uh, subject to go over. They were coming to Texas to film it, and there had been a piece of legislation introduced there and had to do with uh, enforcing the drug laws, and the individual had introduced a law that said that for every time, if, every time a drug dealer gets caught selling drugs, he gets a finger chopped off, and uh, they wanted to discuss that on, uh, on uh, television. Toward the end of the campaign, many of you became aware of the uh, little uh, episode that we had with the National Election Service, when the National Election Service said, well, uh, the Libertarians are non-people, and uh, we, won't, we won't count them. Well, this prompted us to go to New York, and uh, we did a little uh, picketing out in front of NEC, and then uh, the press uh, person I had and myself, we went up to see the national director of uh, the NES, NES, the National Election Service. We sat down and, and talked, and uh, finally I just hit them point blank with, with what they were really proposing. And I said, what, uh, what would you do as a service if a Republican got 45% of the vote, a Democrat got 45% of the vote, and a Libertarian gets 10% of the vote? How are you going to report that on election night? And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, 50-50. And I started to laugh and he got very angry. He just couldn't stand the fact that, you know, it was so absurd, you couldn't get angry. The only way my reaction was just to laugh at him, which made him furious. And <laughs> I think he then called his attorney and was getting ready to throw me out of the office. And it is just, you know, the type of attitude uh, that they have. They'd like us to go away, but that's not going to be the case. I think they're going to be hearing a lot more from us as time goes on, and just by pretending we don't exist, uh, it's not going to solve the problem. Now, you know, David mentioned a little bit about how you can read in the st into the uh, statistics, and uh, uh, there was uh, one letter sent to uh, Libertarian uh, News, and uh, I thought it was a, a real uh, reasonable explanation on how to explain this election because they took uh, Ed Clark's uh, vote of 1980 and they showed that they took all the votes that were non-Republicans and non-Democrats and Ed Clark, hate to report this on poor Ed, he only got 15 percent of them. But David comes along, David got 37 percent of all the non-Republican Democratic votes and now the Paul Maru ticket got 49% of the non-Republican Democratic votes. I say we're really on a roll. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hospers earlier talked uh, some, uh, somewhat about uh, privacy, and I think privacy is a, a, a real important issue because I've decided, uh, after having campaigned for a year, talking to a lot of different kind of groups, that if we wanted to use one particular issue to bring as many groups of people together and to think about what we're talking about, really, I believe it's the privacy issue. Because privacy, to me, means freedom. I mean, how can you have liberty without privacy and vice versa? But privacy is attractive to some who see themselves as very strict uh, conservatives. And it could be uh, educational privacy, it could be religious privacy, it can be financial privacy. But of course, uh, from the more liberal side, there are people who are talking about the civil liberties and sexual privacy and the use of personal uh, <clears throat> substances. This is privacy. And if we can get all the groups together to really understand that privacy brings all the people together, I think this is one of the issues that should be used to unify. And yet, what has generally happened? If we're, ca if we're not cautious, frequently that issue can be used to stereotype us and turn us off because all of a sudden I'll say, oh, the libertarians are those who are the ones who want to shoot heroin. And uh, therefore, what we want to legalize and what we want to permit, if we want to legalize uh, freedom of choice and privacy in the strictest sense, of course, this also means that uh, uh, we, we should uh, not have this look like we're condoning or endorsing or encouraging all the activities that we would permit uh, in a free society. But that was an issue that came up just about every single interview, whether it was the radio or television or the uh, newspapers, the issue of the drugs came up. And I 
always felt good about handling the issue. If there was any one issue that I thought we could talk about the libertarian view because I felt comfortable with it, uh, it was the, the drug issue in particular was the one issue that we wrote up a significant white paper and distributed it, and I felt comfortable because I felt strongly opposed to the use of drugs. At the same time, with a medical background, I felt very strongly that uh, this issue should be handled quite differently uh, than, than society is handling it today. And if we wanted to look at any one particular issue, I think it's the drug issue where we have made tremendous strides. There's been tremendous progress in the drug issue that people are now talking about the foolishness of the drug laws. And uh, it isn't nearly as difficult to discuss this issue uh, in a more open and frank manner. I, I think we're a long way off from uh, achieving our goals, but at least the discussion has changed. I believe it occurred even during this past year or so that there was a significant change in this discussion and uh, I was invited to a, uh, a speech at the uh, Federalist Society and this is a large number of, uh, of attorneys, conservative attorneys more so than uh, uh, libertarians but they had a good panel there of both liberals, conservatives and libertarians discussing, discussing this issue. So it's a, it's a very good opportunity for us to pursue this and continue with it because this drug issue and this crime issue is not going to go away and they're starting to wake up to the fact that realizing that uh, that there is a is a connection there was a report today I believe in the New York Times explaining uh, that another uh, uh, group of policemen were just arrested because it was in their interest to sell drugs inside the prison and I quite frequently made the comment that made people stop and think you know if you uh, can't keep drugs out of the prisons how are you ever going to keep prison off, uh, drugs off the streets and uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that <laughs> On the issue of, of private and personal liberties, there was a one physician friend of mine from Iowa that uh, was a very loyal follower, but he was uh, strictly a conservative. He was very interested in the uh, money issue, but uh, he says, Ron, he says, if you're going to be a libertarian, I'm going to be a libertarian, I'm going to join the party, I'm going to get active. So he joined, he went to his first meeting, and he was uh, somewhat shocked a bit, <laughs> and they started... <laughs> They got into some of the civil liberty things that he wasn't in agreement with, and uh, and he debated with them a bit, and uh, he really didn't know what he was going to do. But he was uh, he was a a real uh, good soldier, and uh, I came back about six months later after this incident, and we were driving along, and he said, you know. He says, I guess, uh, he says, I guess what people do behind a barn really is their own business. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, si he simplified our, our discussion about civil liberty. <laughs> There was uh, one, one individual, though, you know, I, I try very often uh, to be as clear as possible, to always give an answer, even though there are some answers that have been even controversial within the libertarian ranks. But I always made a sincere effort to give the very straight answers. But quite frankly, there was one that I wasn't positive of, and I begged off. A fellow came up, and I knew he was a libertarian because he wanted to know what my, positions, my position was on the white rhinoceros. And I really hadn't thought it through. So, so and I haven't run into any white rhinoceroses yet, so I'm gonna have to just wait and uh, think that out. I had a very interesting uh, interview with uh, the New York Times, and uh, he looked uh, unenthusiastic about the interview. It uh, was one of his uh, routine uh, chores I think he had to go through, but we were going on, and then uh, we got into the budget, and, uh, and he wanted to know our position on, uh, on, on deficits and, and, and the budget. I said, yes, the budget should be balanced. It should be balanced immediately, and it should be balanced by cutting. He said, all right. He says, where would you cut? I said, well, you get rid of the Department of Education, Department of Energy, the Department of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, <laughs> Agriculture. And I went down the whole list, about six or eight things, and he stopped and he says, holy man, he says, this is the first time I've ever had anybody answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> 
then he then he got then he was much more interested in, in the issue and uh, this this was as much fun as anything it was talking to the interviewers who would at the beginning maybe be reluctant but you could see them mellow and get more interested you don't you didn't convert them but they really interview the best the most significant role that I think that we play as candidates and the reason why we have to have a lot of good credible candidates out there talking to the media to educate the media as to know to teach them on to even know what to ask the other candidates that is really what they're doing they're picking our brains to find out what are the options because there's a lot of political mush out there when you think about republicans and democrats <laughs> One of the uh, most exciting features, I think, of the campaign that was new and different and something that we can follow up on in later years is the, is the satellite feed. We did two of those. Uh, uh, this, uh, this followed both of the debates. The one, uh, the one debate, uh, I answered exactly the same questions that were asked the other two candidates, and the next time it was a satellite feed from Houston, and it was prior to the other debates trying to get the questions asked that should be asked the next day. Now the coverage has to be uh, 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 from that very small, but still was significant enough to be worth the effort uh, because it caught some attention. It, caught, it was uh, it was newsworthy in itself. We had good coverage in the Houston area. AP was there. I think it was the New York Times came to that particular function as well. Uh, this. In the age that we live, uh, where the electronic media is changing, uh, we have to break into, of course, to the conventional advertising if we ever want to make a real success of the party. But we also have to be able to use and uh, learn to use the electronic media in the cable televisions. More than half the people now are watching things other uh, than the three majors. So this to me is a major issue and one of the reasons why one of the major projects that I have lined up in, for the next year or so uh, and getting started right away is to start a television program. One that will be prepared professionally and made available to start off with with uh, some major cable network programs and I believe that we can reach uh, not hundreds of millions but hundreds of thousands if not millions of people on a weekly basis and we have uh, we're at the point where we're real close to picking a producer and one of the producers that is most anxious to do the program and yet we have not made this decision and we will be having a meeting meeting soon is uh, Robert Chittister Robert Chittister, and thank you, Marshall, for helping me run him down. Uh, Robert uh, is somebody that I had met before, and of course, Robert Chittister did uh, the Milton Friedman program's uh, Free to Choose, and uh, he's a professional at it, and, uh, and uh, I think that something good is going to come from that. I really believe that we can reach a lot of people. It, uh, I can't promise that you're going to see it on evening prime time in the, in the near future, but we're going to get it on one way or the other, and and inviting people then to respond and uh, find n a lot of new people. I mean, in a campaign, you can find 20 or 30,000 uh, new people of individuals who have heard about the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian message, and they want more information, but I believe the television is the, is the method that we have to use. And I'm not the only one thinking along these lines. There are a lot of other people in the country, a lot of other Libertarians uh, have started to think along this line, and they're using public access cable and different things. So, so uh, I, I think it's very important that we can uh, continue uh, continue to do that. The uh, uh, me the media. I was telling you a little earlier about the reporters who respond. This was especially true when you had the editorial board meetings. Uh, there were usually three or four to get would, would get together, and they would interview. Most of the time, they were very generous and very kind and very respectful to our views. There was, if they were ridiculing us, I think they wouldn't even bother giving us the time of day. A lot of major papers did the interview, and sometimes nothing directly came of it. But I think long term, it's very good. Most of them are uh, very much aware of the libertarian movement in general. Uh, I think that uh, both the Mises Institute and Reason Foundation and Cato and others have done a good job in getting information out to a lot of these newspapers and usually there was one uh, in-house libertarian on most of these staffs. We had one call toward the end of the campaign from ABC Broadcasting Television 
And uh, it was a young man, and he says, let me tell you, he says, we have been trying very, very hard to get you coverage, and we just can't get through the bosses. This was told to me several times, several large newspapers. In the younger generation, there are libertarians out there. We're infiltrating. We're there. And we're sneaking up on them. But they're not in a position of having the authority in the, in the editorial boards or the news boards uh, or the ownership. But uh, I think there is now a reflection of the educational efforts of the last 20 years and uh, for reason to be optimistic and not say that we're all by ourselves and we're completely alone. That, that is not the case. One individual at this meeting today asked me, what was the response of your colleagues back in Washington when you, uh, you went off on this uh, uh, libertarian tangent and running uh, for president and leaving the Republican Party? And I've been back two or three times to visit Washington, visit many of the members, and I'd have to say that the reception has been very respectful. They weren't surprised because they were very much aware of the fact that my philosophy was different than theirs, and they respected me for taking the positions uh, that I did take. Now, I think uh, the interesting thing is the reaction prior to that, because while I was in the House, uh, and it became known that I was the libertarian congressman, they would frequently come up and almost have to come and sit down. So many of them would come and sit down and in a way be apologetic to me and explain their votes. They would come and say, you know, I'm really a libertarian, but I can't quite vote the way you do. <laughs> I don't think my people back home would uh, tolerate that. But they didn't come with the idea of saying, you know, uh, I'm really a libertarian. Now, can you imagine somebody sitting down next to the communist or the socialist or something? There's nothing to be proud of to say that. But they down deep inside... Most of the members of Congress that I met and talked to felt proud about the idea that the word libertarian was a good word and not a negative word. One other thing that I would like to do in a political action committee that I've started, and the political action committee uh, will uh, uh, function probably a little uh, uh, more forcefully at the time we might have a key race to concentrate on. But one thing I would like to do, haven't had the experience in Washington, I know how the wheels work with the members of Congress, is I think one of the best things to have would be a libertarian rating system of the members of Congress on all their votes. What do you think? <laughs> Now, there are two, two advantages to this. Uh, uh, first is that if you're out uh, in the countryside thinking uh, about running against somebody and you want to know how libertarian somebody is, the conventional rating systems won't tell you. But you can look it up and find out whether this guy's a 50 percenter or a 70 percenter or a zero percenter, and, and you would have that information. But the other thing is, is playing on this idea that they think down deep in their heart that libertarianism is good. And uh, they, the congressmen are also very political, if you haven't noticed. Uh, yeah. they, they love, uh, they might not love all the ratings, but they're interested in all the ratings. No matter what rating came out, whether it was a Cope rating or a John Birch Society rating, when they were out, they were usually circulating and saying, hey, what was your rating here? What was your rating here? They're interested in that because they know it has a public, uh, a public message. And uh, if we continue our momentum where people are thinking, not liberal versus conservative, not Republican versus Democrat, but libertarian versus statism, what's my vote for liberty? What is my rating? And I think that if this is done well and the research is done correctly, that uh, some good PR can come from this. This can be released and gets uh, some national attention on this. I think we're at the stage where that would be a very positive thing, and hopefully that will come about sometime uh, later, uh, later in the year. Some of the things that uh, we might consider as a party that uh, might strengthen the, the party and the message and the candidacy of the uh, next candidate is uh, the consideration of the, of the national convention when, you pick the, when we pick the candidate. Uh, I understand the debates that have gone on in the 
so-called benefits that are supposed to come by having the candidate picked uh, a year plus a couple months uh, before the election. But the political disadvantage is, is that there's less attention, it'd be a lot more attention if we had a national convention that was more comparable uh, or more uh, at the time where the other two conventions are occurring in the summer. And this would more or less say that we're leaving that uh, stage of being one of the third party, the, the third party where you just have your convention at any old time. But a major party has a convention when the other two parties are having a convention. I think it would help us uh, in, in, in a couple ways. One is I think we would get uh, uh, more media attention. It was said that the major reason for this was that we needed a candidate uh, in order for the candidate to have his name applied and the organization to uh, be uh, put together in order to get uh, the ballot status taken care of. Well. The ballot status generally doesn't get taken care of before that summer anyway. It seems like so much of that is left uh, late. And the uh, New Alliance Party proved that they didn't need to have an official candidate to get on the ballot. They got on 50 states. They didn't have their, their uh, official candidate till summertime. And therefore, I think they've made the point that we don't necessarily uh, have to have the, have the candidate that early. And uh, the, the ballot access, uh, if, if I had to pick the, the, the uh, most difficult problem of the campaign, it's ballot access. And I would make a couple suggestions on this. Uh, first thing is, if there's any way possible, don't ever put the burden or don't, uh, don't make it so that the burden falls on the shoulders of the candidate to get on the ballots. I mean, this is, this, the party has to be strong enough, both nationally and statewide, to get on the ballot. Now, this is one of the advantages. I think this is one of the best things that's going to come out of the campaign because of Bert Blummert's experience with and his efforts in ballot access. He knows what the ropes are. He has Paul Jacob working with him. Even now they're working. They're working as hard now as they were before, very diligently. And I think the ballot access approach through the National Party with Bert Blummert is key to saving or making a real good candidacy out of the uh, next candidate, next go around. Now, the one thing I would suggest, let's say this happens and they end up getting on 47, 48, 46, 45, who knows what, because maybe the law has got a lot worse. Maybe it takes twice as much effort to get on, and we don't have our 50. The goal ought to be 50. The goal ought to be put all on the burden of ballot access committee. But let's say they don't quite make it. I think that then it should just be dropped, uh, dropped from, from the candidate. I think a candidate should just go out and do his campaigning. I know I didn't accept that position prior to the campaign. I was always the one that said, look, if they're not going to raise the money and the party can't do it and the states can't do it, we're going to do it. We have to be on the ballot. And believe me, it really was very harmful to the campaign in the sense that it didn't ruin the campaign. It just means it, it drained a lot of funds. It drained a lot of resources. It drained a lot of personnel. I mean, person, people who were supposed to be working on the campaign, they would be, they would be with me out on the campaign trail, and they say, well, we got to fly you to Missouri, and they'd take them over. It was, you know, deadlines to meet. It was just no way to do it, and it shouldn't be done that way. And I don't know if there was any way to avoid that up until now, but I believe we're at the stage where we don't have to do it anymore. I think with the experience that we've had this year, with Bert and Paul working together and others, I believe that this thing is going to be turned around and they'll have us, not only will it be away from the candidate next time, but I believe that they'll be on 50 ballots next time as well. One other thing that I would recommend, and uh, we didn't do it this time, and I'd have to take the blame for this, partially at least, and that is uh, the, for the campaign to look like a real campaign, not only should the convention be at a more uh, conventional time, but uh, I think the, the candidates ought to be seen. Well, we were, uh, Andre and I were seen together and we worked together, and Andre, every time I've ever asked him, he came and campaigned and filled in. But really, you know, it was a separate campaign. Andre had to raise his own money, and uh, I think a 
real campaign is going to get to the point where the two people are working closely together and probably have a more unified campaign, not only in, in organization and structure, but fundraising and everything else. That, uh, again, I think would uh, be a reflection of the growth of the party and the maturity of the, of the campaign and, and, and uh, if, if the two would be working uh, much uh, closer together. The uh, media sometimes is uh, accused of being uh, conspiratorial. Uh, we are anxious to sometimes find a reason why they haven't given us the coverage we uh, wanted. And there are days when I feel uh, more conspiratorial than others. And I've generally taken the position that, no, if we become newsworthy, uh, and we do the job, we're going to get the coverage. And uh, I don't think that's a totally accurate statement, but uh, I think there's, that's to caution people to say, yes, we do have to do our, do our job. But then over and above that, I, I am of the inclination to believe that uh, there is a conspiracy, and I put that in quotes, uh, to make sure that we have not too much credibility. Uh, I think that it would be very convenient for the others. I think it's very convenient for the Republican Democrats to make it difficult for us to get on ballots. And I think it's very convenient that uh, anybody other than Republicans and the Democrats are represented by kooks. Either another party or a kooky libertarian or something. Anybody who does not fear the conventional status quo of politics has to look a little nutty so that when it comes to libertarians, they're all in that category. For instance, it's probably not completely accidental that Lyndon LaRouche frequently is said to be a libertarian. Because he, everybody gets lumped in together. Now, the only good reasoning that could come from that is we're all lumped together, and they all say we're libertarians, mainly because we're the strongest faction of the alternate choices. But I think the media, very interestingly, will frequently put some of the uh, kooks in there and put us all, all together. Uh, this came up after the election. During the election, there was an uh, inquiry made from the New York Times for us to write an article about third parties and, and our, our, our candidacy. We wrote two versions of the article. It was, they were not accepted. And I think what we had there was one individual trying to go to the board, and it didn't get through. A couple weeks after the campaign, maybe about a month ago, I guess, finally an article appeared in the New York Times going over third parties. And did anybody see this in the New York Times? The need for a third party movement in this country. <laughs> Written by the mayor of Burlington, a socialist. And uh, he needed, they needed they, there was a need because people were frustrated with government. And half the things he was saying were exactly true. Frustration and anger and people weren't voting and all these kind of things going on. He said there was a need for a third party movement. And uh, I wrote a, a letter back. I thought, well, maybe the libertarian, the, uh, the recent libertarian candidate could get an answer. I wrote back and gave our side of it. And I waited for all the answers to come in. So the answers to that editorial finally came in by the Greens Party. And, and that was the discussion. It was a full discussion in the New York Times. Now, I don't believe they're that dumb. I don't believe they're that ignorant about what's happening. And they got my letter. So in other words, I believe it's very clearly designed to make sure that we don't gain the credibility. But if we do our job right and we have the correct message, we will then have to overcome those obstacles. They're going to put nothing out on a platter to us. So our job, of course, will be to continue the efforts and to make the news where they cannot, uh, they cannot ex uh, exclude us. You know, uh, there were a couple good editorials. As a matter of fact, I saw a lot of good, new, new, good newspaper articles that I liked and I enjoy, enjoyed. One I enjoyed the most was, if the Founding Fathers were here today, they would vote for Ron Paul. I especially liked that one. But uh, Warren Brooks, uh, who is a national, more economics writer, uh, had a nice article out. And his title here was, Ron Paul has the only solution for the deficit and gives our position pretty well that uh, you solve the deficit problem by, by cutting a lot of spending. But I guess the, my favorite article was written by James uh, Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick is a very, very well-known, well-read national political writer. And um, some people read the article and didn't like it because there are some uh, not... Uh, 
the rather not so subtle criticisms uh, about what's going on, but then I believe he has it generally in the right perspective. And I want to read a few paragraphs of this article because I think it really gives us a pretty good idea about what they're thinking about us, and I don't think it's all bad. I think there's a lot of good things here. And uh, this, this one's title says, Dr. Paul makes uncomfortably good sense. And uh, here's a quote, he says, what is to be said of such a candidate? In the conventional wisdom, what one says is that Paul is nuts. Very generous. <laughs> In a more generous appraisal, he is naive, idealistic, ingenuous, and simplistic. After these modest observations have been made, it must also be said that the gentleman makes uncomfortably good sense. I mean, we're making them feel it because they know we have a message. The interesting thing is that Ron Paul believes, he truly believes, he believes in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he believes that society prospers when the people rely on their own resources first and look to government last. He regards politicians as a breed of hypocrites who are in, the fa who are in favor of economy until an economy affects their constituents. In the newspaper business, we seldom meet true believers. It is therefore a refreshing experience to spend an hour talking with Paul. Viewed in the real world, his proposals are preposterous, impossible, unachievable. And yet, and yet, he says, in his farewell speech in the House of Representatives in 1984, he spoke of farm subsidies. Quote from my farewell speech, we learn nothing from the depression years and continue to pay farmers to raise crops not needed, and then we pay them to stop planting. Our policies drive prices of our policies drive prices of commodities down, so we prop up the prices and put up the surpluses. The consumer suffers, the farmer suffers, the country suffers, but our policies never change. We just legislate more of the same programs that caused the problem in the first place. That makes Jim Kelpatrick uneasy because he knows we're right. If we're right there, he's thinking in his mind, maybe we're right across the board. The nominee has no illusions about winning, though he cheerfully observes that if all the people who are dissatisfied with George Bush and Michael Dukakis would vote for him, he'd make a respectable showing. I expect he has a valid point there. One other quote that uh, was written uh, after the campaign, and I think it's very interesting, uh, comes across in the national syndicated column, let me congratulate the American people smart enough not to vote. What difference does it make when 99% of the incumbents are reelected, when right conspires with left to loot the treasury, Republicans lack the courage to cut spending, Democrats lack the courage to raise taxes, both annually seek sanctuary and backrooms deal with a White House where no one is held accountable? We have two parties of government now. One prefers borrow and spend, and the other tax and spend. Now that sounds almost like a libertarian, wouldn't you say? You know, it's written by, it's written by somebody who had been in the, in the employment of Ronald Reagan for several years and who is now an avowed Republican conservative, and that comes from Pat Buchanan. Now, I think this is very encouraging. I think this is good material, and uh, I know Pat Buchanan. I've been on his show. He has been very kind and generous, and, and I, think, uh, I think he is very much aware of what's happening. He doesn't mention the libertarians there, he doesn't mention that position, but he has to have been influenced uh, by our viewpoint to come up with these statements that are so libertarian-oriented. Uh, the uh, election in general was, to me, personally a tough and trying year for various reasons, but to me it was very much worth it. But the only time it was worth it is when I know that there are others who have cared about it. 
And I know when I come to meetings like this and I meet so many of you and I've had not one individual come up, maybe I will after this talk, but I have not had one individual come up and say, hey, you really did a lousy job. Everything has been so positive and so complimentary. That makes it worthwhile because if I did not have your support, there is no movement with uh, an individual. There is only a movement with a group of people who come together who have a general agreement on some principles and ideas. This na nation is starved for that. This nation is starved for the libertarian message. This nation is starved for the libertarian party. Let's go get them from now on. Thank you very much. I think we have some. I think we have time for a few questions. One question. One question. I talk too long. Uh, Ron, you had 18 months to run, and you had some things that you had to learn and build up to get up the learning curve. Looking back at it, what do you think would be an optimal time for a new candidate to have, where he had enough time to get up to speed, but didn't have to spend a year and a half doing? Uh. You mean to pick the candidate in what particular month to know for sure? To have the candidate have enough time, just the right amount of time, not too much, not too much. Well, I don't know whether there is an exact amount of time. I'm thinking of it more from the practical and political viewpoint because even if the, the convention was in June and he was became the candidate, uh, then the question is, is, does that mean that's when he started? And I don't think that's the case. The individual would have had to start, you know, many months before going out and soliciting your support and going to the conventions. But uh, I think the convention should be somewhere in the summer, you know, May or June. And then they would have uh, three or four, three or four months. Uh, well, no, it would be uh, six months then, which would be, would be much better. But I don't think that would uh, let, the, let the person off the hook for needing to do the work necessary, which means to uh, reach out and uh, get a lot of people. Now, the one, uh, uh, okay, go ahead. I think we can squeeze your question in. Yeah, your views on the following, funds and Elrock. Oh, good, I'm glad you brought those two up. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, priding myself about always giving very, very straight answers earlier, right? Well, tell you what, on the uh, matching funds, I'm a little wishy-washy on it. <laughs> um, I have always opposed it. Right now, I'm in a position of saying I do oppose it, but I listen very carefully to the arguments for taking the funds for the purpose of overcoming the tremendous obstacles. I, this came up at a lot of the libertarian meetings that were mixed with others that weren't uh, libertarian party members. We frequently would take a poll and the hands would go up. Uh, generally, a third of the people would be for the, uh, for the uh, taking the funds. And, um, I'm, I'm not saying that I could not be persuaded uh, to, to accept that idea to use funds only to overcome the legal obstacles that have been put in our way. Uh, but uh, I understand both sides of that argument. I think both sides are pretty strong on the argument. Now, LROC, what does that stand for again? Libertarian Republic, Republican, Republican. I've worked so hard getting away from those Republicans, I can't understand so often since in this past year, frequently I ran into these Republicans within the Libertarian group. Uh, you know, I have, a very strong I have a very strong opinion about it. And that is that it always totally amazed me to think about the amount of credibility that a Republican group within a Libertarian group how much, how much uh, attention they got. People will actually ask them their opinion. Can you imagine the Republicans calling me up, inviting me to their convention so I can stand out there and do things, or call me up and give me an interview in their publication, in their Republican publication? Doesn't make any sense. Sure, everybody has a right to their own approach. I don't, I don't necessarily think the approach of libertarianizing some Republicans is such a terrible idea. I think it's a great idea. I happen to follow that for a long time. Where my contention would be is, 
why in the world would somebody gain very much credibility by allowing them to uh, sort of come in and make use of the libertarian movement to undermine the libertarian party structure. So I think that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think when you don't see that type of activity where the libertarian magazines don't feel compelled and feel guilty, they don't ask, wonder what the Elrock people are thinking. At the time when we don't have to do that anymore, I think we will have matured a little bit more. Thank you very much.